Welcome back to another installment of Donning the Armor. This morning we will begin in Genesis chapter 35, verse 1. Then God said to Jacob, Arise, go up to Bethel, and dwell there, and make an altar there to God, who appeared to you when you fled from the face of Esau, your brother. So God is telling Jacob, Go back to where you saw the ladder, the staircase leading to heaven, that you named Bethel. Go back there and build another altar. Go dwell there with your flocks for a time. And Jacob said to his household and all who were with him, Put away the foreign gods that are among you. Purify yourselves and change your garments. Then let us arise and go up to Bethel, and I will make an altar there to God, who answered me in the day of my distress, and has been with me in the way which I have gone. So they gave Jacob all the foreign gods which were in their hands, and the earrings which were in their ears, and Jacob hid them under the Tenebrith tree which was in Shechem. So who were now all in his household who has foreign gods? Why does anybody have foreign gods? Well, these are the people who his sons took captive after they slaughtered the men of Shechem. These are the children, these are the women who did not follow the Lord. So he's now saying to these people who are now of his household, you now need to put away these foreign gods. They're going to be hid under a tenebith tree in Shechem, meaning they're being left where they were. They're being left behind. They are done from our lives. Now we need to change your garments. You need to purify yourselves. You no longer have these earrings, which were symbols of your, uh, you being chained and being linked to Shechem. That is now gone because you are no longer linked to them. And they journeyed and the terror of God was upon the cities that were all around them. And they did not pursue the sons of Jacob. So Jacob was worried about these other peoples of Canaan coming for him. But much like Abimelech in Gerar, the terror of God has fallen around them. And they know not to come after these people, whether they wanted to or not. So Jacob came to Luz, that is Bethel, which is in the land of Canaan. He and all the people who were with him. And he built an altar there and called the place El Bethel. Because there God appeared to him and when he fled from the face of his brother. So they make it all the way to Luz, which is now, which is by the time Moses writing, Bethel. And he built another altar. He called the place El Bethel. And here is him rededicating the people who were with him to now be appropriate in his place they were to be like it said abraham was to circumcise all of the men and boys of his household whether they were born to him or not didn't matter they were of his household they needed to be now of god's household to say now deborah rebecca's nurse died and she was buried below bethel under the tent of a tree so the name of it was called Alan Bakuth. So this becomes a little bit of note later. Uh, not causal, but maybe um, it's correlated, not caused the future events. But it's something to, that is worth noting. That's why it is in Scripture. Then God appeared to Jacob again when he came from Paddan Aram and blessed him. And God said to him, your name is Jacob. Your name shall not be called Jacob anymore, but Israel shall be your name. So he called his name Israel. Also God said to him, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and multiply a nation and a company of nations shall proceed from you and kings shall come from your body. The land which I gave Abraham and Isaac I give to you, and to your descendants after you I give this land. Then God went up from him in the place where he had talked with him. So Jacob set up a pillar in the place where he had talked with him, a pillar of stone, and he poured a drink offering on it and poured oil on it. And Jacob called the name of the place where God spoke with him Bethel. 
So it's a restatement, possibly of just the events, but it also is a restatement of God reaffirming the covenant which was created with Jacob. Jacob said, hey, if you will be with me, you will no longer be the God of my fathers, but you will also be my God. And God is continually reaffirming these covenants that is made. And Jacob, because of that, is anointing the altar, anointing it with oil, which is often in scripture a symbol of the Holy Spirit. Now, this Holy Spirit is not a man's to give out, but it's it's symbolic of it. And this is Jacob saying, this is the place where God spoke to me. This is consecrated land that God has appeared to me. That's why it is special. Then they journeyed from Bethel, and when there was but a little distance to Ephra, Ephrath, Rachel labored in childbirth. She had hard labor. So this is where the notation that Deborah, Deborah, Rachel's nurse, died, because now she's having a rough, hard childbirth, and she does she no longer has that nurse, possibly the same nurse who birthed Joseph. She does not have that nurse anymore. Now it came to pass when she was in hard labor that the midwife said to her, do not fear, you will have this son also. And so it was, as her soul was departing, for she died, that she called his name Benoni. So the midwife said, do not fear, your son will be born. You know, she doesn't say you will be fine. She just said, "You, this son will be born to you. And he was. He was born healthy, but she died in this hard childbirth. And she, with her dying breath, basically named him Benoni. But his father called him Benjamin. So Rachel died and was buried on the way to Ephrath, that is Bethlehem. And Jacob set a pillar on her grave, which is the pillar of Rachel's grave to this day. Now, Rachel is one who was not buried in the tomb of Abraham and Sarah because she died on the way. But you see, Rachel, all Jacob doesn't name any of his kids but Benjamin. And this becomes an affront to some of his other kids, especially Reuben, because in a way, Benjamin now is saying that he is the right hand of Jacob. Now, normally the right hand of any ruler is the person, the advisor that they place the most trust in. Um, as we'll go on to the story, as we go on through the accounts of Genesis, we will see Joseph becomes the the second in command of all Egypt. He is Pharaoh's right hand. So as the youngest, the 12th born son, the other sons do not look happily on the fact that Benjamin is now being referred to in that way because it changes the name he was originally given and because it it puts a position upon him which the older kids believe they should have. Then Israel journeyed and pitched his tent beyond the tower of Eder. And it happened when Israel dwelt in the land that Reuben went and lay with Bilhah, his father's concubine, and Israel heard about it. This is one of the reasons why this happened. Because Reuben, the firstborn of Leah, which the firstborn overall, sees that he now is calling his 12th son his right hand when Reuben, rightfully by heir, by birth, should be Jacob's right hand. So he goes into his father's concubine. He lays with her. In a way, I've heard it said that, well, he's comforting Bilhah. He's doing that. He's doing it also as a way to assert dominance over his father. Such is the way that uh, we will get into in, I believe it happens in Kings, but it could be in Second Samuel, but where uh, the oldest son, whose name is escaping me at the moment, Absalom, David's son Absalom, when he runs David out of Jerusalem and takes over as king, 
that he goes and consummates with 10 of his father's concubines in public on the roof of the palace to show dominance over his father. Now the sons of Jacob were 12. The sons of Leah were Reuben, Jacob's firstborn, and Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, and Zebulun. The sons of Rachel were Joseph and Benjamin. The sons of Bilhah, Rachel's maidservant, were Dan and Nephtali. The sons of Zilpah, Leah's maidservant, were Gad and Asher. These were the sons of Jacob who were born to him in Paddan Aram. Then Jacob came to his father Isaac and Mamre, and Kirjath Arba, that is Hebron, where Abraham and Isaac had dwelt. Now the days of Isaac were 180 years. So Isaac breathed his last and died, and was gathered to his people, being old and full of days, and his sons Esau and Jacob buried him. So we see Jacob and Esau do eventually get back together. He does eventually get there. It takes a long time. There's a lot of things that happen in the meantime, but he does get there. Now, I do find it just interesting that this whole incident happened with the separation for 20 years because Isaac said he was dying, almost as if he wanted a last meal from Esau. But yet he goes on to live many, many more years. And this is another way of saying that, and we can take from this that don't believe we know God's timing. You know, in a way, he had more time. He thought he didn't. He was numbering his days in a way that God wasn't. Now, on the flip side, we have people who say, why should I, if Jesus is going to forgive everything, why should I do it now when I'm young? Why not enjoy my life, live in sin, and just repent of it later? And the reason for that is because we don't know when later is. God knows when later is. Isaac thought his days were numbered 20 plus years before they came. If we're thinking we have 20 plus years left to go, we might not. And man is appointed but one time to die on this earth. That is our chance to get, make ourselves right with God. For us to raise our eyes up to that symbol that he has placed before us. The Israelites, while wandering, had a bronze serpent as a symbol to be cured of the snake bites. We have the cross. We have the sacrifice of Christ that we can look to and say, I trust in that for my salvation. This life is our chance to do that. Once it's over, that chance is gone. So if you're putting that off, you're rolling the dice. You're gambling that God has, an, has appointed for you another day. And we don't know that we have one. Don't assume to know the days God has allotted in our lives. Because we could be woefully, woefully wrong. If Jacob or Isaac had not miscounted his days... If Isaac had not proclaimed that he was near death and needed to apply the blessing in that moment, Rebecca had not would not have acted. Jacob would not have stolen the blessing and the family would not have been broken apart. When we act as God's uh, mediary, when we act in place of God, we cause problems for ourselves. And we have a habit as humans of doing it all the time because we want to be the ones to do the work when really we need to listen to him and just follow commands. Being proactive is great. But now when we're doing the work of the Lord, we want to react to what he wants us to do, not be proactive and assume what he has in store for us. So moving on to chapter 36 with verse 1. Now this is the genealogy of Esau, who is Edom. So it's saying Esau 
Edom, the country, that comes from Esau. Esau took wives from the daughters of Canaan, Adah, the daughter of Elon, the Hittite, and Aholabah, the daughter of Anna, the daughter of Zibon, the Hivite, and Basemath, Ishmael's daughter, sister of Nebajoth. Now Adah bore Epa, Ephaz to Esau, and Basemath bore Ruol, and Abamala bore Jusha, Jalamum, and Korah. These were the sons of Esau who were born to him in the land of Canaan. Now, as I said, I have no fear of pronouncing out any of these names. I know I'm going to butcher them. And you know what? I've seen so many pastors just listen to so many pastors, not want to embarrass themselves by butchering these names. So they just skip them. And that's fine. I mean, it, you don't want the mispronunciation to get in the way of a Bible study. But since we're reading through scripture, I'm, I'm going to pronounce them. I'm going to pronounce them wrong. If you know them correctly, great, because I, I could listen to somebody pronounce these correctly. And two minutes later, I'm going to pronounce them incorrectly because my mouth is not going to do what I know is true in my brain. But sometimes we also wonder, what is the purpose of genealogies? Why, why have them? Why bother going through them now, all these millennia later now, not even centuries, millennia? Like, what do these have to do for us? What are they, what are they revealing to us? What purpose do they serve? They serve the, I know they serve the purpose for the Israelites of the time, but for us now, what do they, what do they mean? Well, some of these names we see and they matter. Korah. Korah, the sons of Korah, wrote some of the Psalms. Korah led a revolt in the book of Numbers against Moses and Aaron and was swallowed whole into the earth. Yeah, we'll get there. But so some of these names will peek out at us. We will notice them right away. Some of them we won't. Some of them, we would have to do a name study to be like, oh, you know what? I do see where that connects. But all scripture is good for edification of the body of Christ. So I'm not going to skip any of it. So picking back up in verse six, then Esau took his wives, his sons, his daughters, and all persons of his household, his cattle and all his animals and all his goods, which he had gained in the land of Canaan. And went to a country away from the presence of his brother Jacob. For their possessions were too great for them to dwell together in the land there where they were strangers could not support them because of their livestock. So Esau dwelt in Mount Ser. Esau is Edom. See that pointed out a couple times because for the Israelites that's important. Because the Edomites were their enemies often. Uh, you know, as the centuries go by, the descendants don't look back on their brothers as brothers. I mean, how many times if we did a genetic test now of someone, we could find ancestors we have who were brothers in the 1600s. I don't, I don't even know the names of my great grandparents. I definitely don't know somebody who lived 400 years ago. It's just the, the sad reality of the world that typically as human beings, we aren't remembered by anybody after our own grandchildren. Two generations will remember us, our children, our grandchildren, probably. But by the time our grand grandchildren come, they don't have no idea who we are and they don't remember us. We're a distant memory. So as for that, the author of Genesis, most likely Moses, continues to point out that Esau is where Edom came from Esau, I should say. And this is the genealogy of Esau, the father of the Edomites in Mount Seir. These were the names of Esau's sons. So this is now getting a little bit more specific of, we already went over the genealogy, so why are we going over it again? Well, now we're going over it again to point out that this is where the Edomites that live in Mount Seir 
live in that area. This is where they came from. These were the names of the sons of Esau's sons. These were the names of Esau's sons. Eliphaz, the son of Adah, the wife of Esau, and Ruel, the son of Basemath, the wife of Esau. And the sons of Eliphaz were Timon, Omar, Zepho, Gadom, and Kenaz. Now Timnah was the concubine of Eliphaz, Esau's son, and she bore Amalek, once again, a name that will pop out because the Amalekites are the ones who saw was supposed to eradicate from the face of the earth, did not, ended up killing him and his son, Jonathan. And the Amalekite is also the one who tried to kill all the Jews in the book of Esther. So that name, once again, going through this, these names pop out at us. These were the sons of Adah, Esau's wife. These were the sons of Ruel, Nahath, Zerah, Shammah, Mizah, or Mizah. These were the sons of Basemath, Esau's wife. These were the sons of Aholabama, Esau's wife, the daughter of Anah, the daughter of Zeban. And she bore to Esau Jusha, or Jush, Jama, Jalam, and Korah. These were the chiefs of the sons of Esau. So now you get to, all right, these were the children born. Now these are the chiefs of Edom. These were the chiefs now born. And then later we will get to the kings. But these were the chiefs of the sons of Esau. The sons of Eliphaz, the firstborn son of Esau, were chief Temnem or Temem. Chief Omar, Chief Zepho, Chief Kanaz, Chief Korah, Chief Gadam, Chief Amalek. These were the chiefs of Eliphaz in the land of Edom. They were the sons of Adah. These were the sons of Ruel, Esau's son. Chief Nath, Chief Zerah, Chief Shema, Chief Mizah. These were the chiefs of Ruel in the land of Edom. These were the sons of Basemath, Esau's wife. These were the sons of Abimelech. I know I pronounce these every single time. I'm trying to get one of them to be right. Esau's wife, Chief Jush, Chief Jalam, Chief Korah. These were the chiefs who descended from Abimelech, Esau's wife, the daughter of Anah. These were the sons of Esau, who is Edom, and these were their chiefs. These were their sons. These were the sons of Sir the Horite, who inhabited the land, Lotan, Shobel, Zibion, Ana, Dishan, Ezer, and Dishan. These were the chiefs of the Horites, the sons of Ser in the land of Edom. And the sons of Lotan were Hori, Haman, Lotan's sister was Timnah. These were the sons of Shobal, Alvin, Manahath, Elba, Shephtho, and Oman. These were the sons of Zibion, both Alat or Aja and Ana. These were this was the Ana who found the water in the wilderness as he pastured the donkeys of his father Zibion. These were the children of Ana, Dishan in Ab Aholibama, and the daughter of Ana. These were the sons of Dishan, Hemdan, Eshban, Erithron, and Sharon. These were the these were the sons of Azer, Bilhan, Zevan, Akan. These were the sons of Dishan, Uz, and Aran. We know those two names because those two names are cities that the Israelites come up against in war later. These were the chiefs of the Horites: Chief Lotan, Chief Shobel, Chief Zibion, Chief Adnan, Chief Dishan, Chief Ezer, Chief Dishan. These were the chiefs of the Horites, according to their chiefs in the lands of Sir. Now these were the kings who reigned in the land of Edom before any king reigned over the children of Israel. So once again, we continue to go, which is, this is why people and scholars sometimes will argue whether or not this was written by Moses, because kings of Israel far in the future, oh, 
far, far after Moses. And in Deuteronomy, part of the law that Moses gives out is for future kings of Israel. They're not supposed to have kings. But he's giving, he is giving uh, requirements that kings are supposed to fulfill to be kings of Israel. Now, why? How would Moses know that they're going to have kings when they're not supposed to and wouldn't for like four centuries after him? Well, because he's receiving revelation from God and God does know they will eventually have a king. God is not reactionary. He is not, we're not zigzagging and confusing God and he's got to see where we're going to go. We make our choices. We're not slot cars. We can choose which way we want to go. But the reality of the situation is God already knows where we went. God, Alpha and Omega, beginning and end. He lives outside of time, in the past, in the present, and in the future, all in the same moment, are the same to him. So when he creates, at creation, he is also in that very moment, in eternity. So that's how he knows who is it's saved and who isn't. He knows whether I make a right turn or a left. He knows what I eat for dinner tonight, where I have no idea. He knows what decision I will make. He doesn't make me, he doesn't force me to make that decision, but he does know what I chose. So God knows that he, they will reject him. The children of Israel reject him for a king. And he is laying the groundwork for that through Moses. He knows it's going to happen. Now, scholars will now come back because they really don't believe all that strongly sometimes anyway. You have a lot of secular scholars. You have a lot of, a lot of Jews now are culturally Jewish without being religiously Jewish. So they'll look at these and they'll look at them as a text instead of the inspired word of God without any miraculousness to them at all. And they will say, well... This had to have been written during King David's time as a way to go through as mythology for their people. So that's why these things don't seem to make sense when they make total sense when you realize that God is God. But anyway, picking back up in 32, Bela, the son of Beor, reigned in Edom, and the name of his city was Dianaba. And when Bela died, Jobab, the son of Zerah the, of Basra, reigned in his place. When Jobab died, Husham of the land of the Tenemites reigned in his place. And when Husham died, Hadad, the son of Bed uh, Bedad, who attacked, the, attacked Midian in the field of Moab, reigned in his place. And the name of his city was Evith. When Hadad died, Samla of Meskara reigned in his place. And when Semla died, Saul of Rehoboth by the river reigned in his place. When Saul died, Baal Hanan, son of Ekbar, reigned in his place. And when ba Baal Hanan, the son of Ekbar, died, Hadar reigned in his place. And the name of his city was Paul. His wife's name was Mehethabel, the daughter of Metred, the daughter of Mezabab. And these were the names of the chiefs of Esau according to their families and their places. By their names, Chief Timnah, Chief Ava, Chief Jethra, Chief Abamala, Chief Ela, Chief Pinan, Chief Kenaz, Chief Temnan, Teman, Chief Mizbar, Chief Magdal, Chief Iram. These were the chiefs of Edom according to their dwelling places in the land of their possession. Esau was the father of the Edomites. Once again, repeating, our father, Israel, his brother, is the father of the Edomites. It's unfortunate to see brothers come against each other through their descendants in a way, but it is a reality. And the Bible speaks to reality and the unfortunateness of it at times. But anyway, that ends 
this installment of Donning the Armor. I hope it was fruitful for you. And I hope to see you again next time. But until then, be blessed.